If you've ever looked at someone and thought, man, that person's just really smart. They're able to understand things so quickly. They must be a genius. I'm here to say that you can actually train yourself to be like that person. That's what this video is going to be about, how you can train yourself to think like a genius. For those of you that are new, I'm Dr. Justin Sung. I'm a medical doctor as well as a learning coach, which means I work with people to help them study and learn more efficiently. And before we talk about how we can actually train ourselves, we need to understand that it's first of all possible to do that. A lot of the times when I work with students or professionals of any age, there are often some beliefs about what you can and can't change. Often people that haven't had good academic experiences earlier on in life can pigeonhole themselves into thinking that they're just not a good studier, they're not good at learning, they just can't learn in certain settings. And these concepts are usually not true. Most of the time, it's just about what your brain is used to doing and what you're comfortable with doing. However, these may not actually be fixed. In fact, the branch of science, which we sort of refer to now broadly as neuroplasticity, is something that has been growing in interest and research over sort of the last 30 years. And we now know, unlike 40, 50 years ago, that the brain is actually very, very adaptable. The brain is able to adapt and modify itself and reprogram itself in more ways than we thought. So we don't know exactly where the limits of neuroplasticity are, but we do know that most things can to a certain degree be retrained and reprogram, which is a good thing because if you've previously been a student that's been academically unsuccessful or really struggling, then that doesn't have to be your entire life. It is possible to retrain yourself. And this is the fundamental idea that my course is based on, which is the idea that it is possible to retrain this and you can actually then use that to excel in your academic studies. Now, it doesn't mean that just because it's retrainable, that it will be retrained so easily. The process of retraining the way that you think can take months or even years. However, it is possible. And if it's something that's really important for you and you want to have the feeling of academic freedom to feel that opportunities are in your grasp and you can take hold of them and learning is not going to be the barrier, then I'm here to say that it is very possible. And we're going to be covering some of the most important principles to do that in this video. So let's break down what we are talking about when we're saying a genius. What are the patterns of genius that we're essentially referring to. Now, it's important to note that when I'm talking about genius in this context, we are talking about academic genius. The idea of being smart, street smart or smart, emotionally intelligent, uh, completely valid. But for the context of this video, I will be restricting the discussion mostly to the typical kind of things that you think about when you think about learning or studying. Now, usually when we talk about genius, we are referring to usually a few pretty discrete factors. The first thing is often their memory. When we say someone's a genius, we often say that they have a really good memory and they're able to retain information for a long period of time. And not only are they able to retain this information and they have a good memory, but number two, they usually have a very deep level of understanding. So not only do they retain information, but what they do retain is of a high quality. They're able to learn things very, very deeply. They can maybe apply new information to complex problems more easily and earlier on. And the ability to just move through the information and use the information is more flexible and fluid than someone that is not a genius. So the reason that we want to break it up is because we can think of about what the components are that make up having a good memory or having deep understanding. We know that when it comes to memory, one of the things that affects your memory the most is the way that you encode information the first time round. And I have other videos talking extensively about this. So this goes back to good, high quality encoding. If you're not encoding information correctly, there isn't really any way for you to have a better memory. It's very, very time consuming, very challenging, very repetitive and tedious and frustrating to try to hold on to information through pure repetition alone 
using low quality encoding techniques. So the first thing is about increasing our encoding. In terms of deepening our understanding, what we're looking at here is sort of the wider field that is often referred to as deep processing. And deep processing is a term that's sort of thrown around all over the place. And the definition for what we are referring to when we talk about deep processing is pretty varied, but usually what we're talking about is the ability to take information and then think about it in a bigger picture. So we're able to connect that information to other things. And because we know how a piece of information is related to other pieces of information, it means that we are able to see it from multiple different angles, which develops a more nuanced and more uh, fluid understanding of the topic. So we can see how we can apply it in multiple different angles. An example of this would be if I gave you a, a never before seen item, like, I don't know, this pen stylus. And I said that this pen stylus is really, really useful to use as a paperweight. And that's the only frame in which you were able to understand the pen stylus, is that you use it as a paperweight. Well, we know, based on our understanding of what a pen stylus is, is that that's really not doing it justice in terms of the amount of functionality that it can have. But you wouldn't really know to apply it if you weren't told that it has these other features. Deep processing is the ability to take this information and explore it to discover the features that it has and see the ways that it can be applied and manipulated so that we can really make the most out of that information. And the side effect is that because of the fact that when you do good deep processing, we understand all the nuances of the information, we're able to create more relationships with it, which means it has more places that it can belong. Our brain knows how to think about it more easily. It's more organized. And these things directly increase the quality of our encoding as well. So there is a relationship here where good deep processing increases encoding, which it further improves the quality of our memory. The other really important part of deep processing is that it's activating this thing that I've talked about previously, which is called higher order learning. Now, higher order learning and deep processing are sort of, in this case, synonymous with each other. When we're referring to higher order learning, we're talking about the types of cognitive processes, the types of thoughts that we have about the information we consume that would force us to create more organization and more meaning to that information, which therefore increases the encoding, which therefore increases our memory and also allows us to use the information to a greater depth. One of the best frameworks that we can really use for this is called the Revised Bloom's Taxonomy. I mentioned it in a lot of other videos as well. I talk about it all the time. Uh, or another one that we can use is called the Solo Taxonomy. You'll see if you look at both of them that they're actually very similar. There's some trends between them, but I like to break it down very, very simply like this. There are sort of four main stages of learning. And in this case, we'll say that the first stage is the highest order. And then the fourth is the lowest order. In the fourth stage, we're really thinking about information in isolation. That is the key feature of lower order learning. Information is viewed purely just as what it is. It's not related to anything else. It doesn't have a meaning associated with it. It doesn't seem particularly important. So study techniques that facilitate low order learning are things like rote memorization, just repeating things over and over again, rewriting your notes out, rereading your notes, doing flashcards that test purely on just basic fact recall, even explaining how something works, like a process or a cycle or a concept can still just be low order learning because that concept could just be in isolation. So anything that is viewed in isolation is lower order learning. And the sad reality is that most study techniques that are commonly used are lower order learning. And the main reason is because lower order learning is much, much easier to do. It requires pretty much no real effort whatsoever. And therefore, it's the most common method of learning that people tend to revert to. We go a little bit higher and we're starting to see how information can be applied and related specifically to maybe one or two other concepts. So 
at a middle level of learning, we're starting to apply the information to contexts that are different to how we initially would have learned it. If it's a maths or an engineering problem, we're able to change some of the variables. We can maybe mix and match some of the scenarios and we can apply the information to a real world problem. So it's definitely a step up from your normal, just isolated learning. The next step beyond this is when we're actually starting to create more relationships and groups. Here, we're really entering into a higher order of learning. Now, the information is not viewed in isolation. All information that we consume, whether it's read or listened to or seen on a YouTube video, we are taking that information, we're thinking about it, and we're thinking, how is that similar or different to other information that I've learned or already know or am learning right now? How is that different to other sources of information? We're finding relationships between them. Cause and effect relationships, form versus function, beginning versus end, before versus after. We're trying to find these different patterns that we can leverage off of. And what this does is it allows the information to feel a little bit more intuitive because we know how to think about it now. It's not just a random isolated piece of information, it's information that actually has meaning. It is related to other things. So now, because the brain sees that this information is related to so many other things, it's a lot more likely to retain it. And because, as I mentioned before, we're seeing it from multiple different angles, we're able to see multiple different ways that we can apply this information and how we can combine it with other concepts to apply it in more complex or nuanced ways. As a result of seeing how different ideas are related to each other, we're also able to group some of these ideas together. And we're able to say that all these ideas actually are related to each other. They may serve a similar purpose. They may be important for similar reasons. And so we can actually start grouping them together into these sort of boxes. And we can have groups inside groups, inside groups, inside groups, and it gets progressively more and more organized. It's at this level where information really starts to make sense. Those light bulb moments, those points where it feels like it just fits together and we can think about it and it's not about us having just memorized things and recalling it, it feels a little bit more genuine. It feels like we really know it and we can approach the information from multiple different angles. And that's because each piece of information has multiple entry and exit points, lots of relationships going to and from each piece of information. So now we have more of a network of knowledge, which have these big landmarks, which are the groups that we have created for the information. And that makes it a lot easier for our brain to hold on to it and directly improves our quality of encoding. So study techniques that facilitate this would be doing things like mind maps where you're really focusing on creating good groups and good quality relationships between them. There'll be things like creating high quality questions that challenge you on the relationship between different ideas. And then the top here, the highest order that we can really get to, now we are creating priorities and we are making judgments on the groups and relationships. So not only are we saying that we can group the information, not only are we able to say it's related, but we are now even able to say which relationship is more important than another relationship. We're able to make a judgment call on how important one group is in a certain context versus another group. We're able to say we could group the information this way or we could group the information this way. There is a relationship between these and so we're having to actively prioritize. And so this is the next level beyond because before we we're just comparing concepts and grouping concepts, but now we're comparing entire networks against other entire possible networks. And so our brain is working overtime and all of that effort and energy is going into deepening our understanding and deepening our memory. And so that's gonna help us to understand things faster. And this is where neuroplasticity kicks in because the more we do this and the more we exercise this type of thinking, the better our brain gets at the process. We start recognizing patterns in the information. Our brain doesn't have to try so hard to find the connections and these groups become more and more intuitive. And over time, it becomes just as easy 
as your old method of studying, but now it's actually facilitating higher quality encoding. And this is how you can train yourself to be a genius. It's tough work at the beginning, but as you get those reps in over time, and I am talking realis realistically uh, months to, to probably more like years, but over that period of time, you do start feeling that it's getting easier and easier and easier. And at that point, your brain has literally been retrained to be smarter. Okay, so that's the theory. That's kind of the overall direction and strategy that we want to apply. So let's now make that a little bit more concrete with some actual steps that you can take. Now, these steps are ones that are based on my experience working with students. And yes, there are uh, component pieces of research here and there about how each of these things work. And I have other videos talking more about the evidence behind uh, each of the individual principles. But it is really about taking all of that research together and putting it into a practical system that actually works. Any of you who have spent some time reading educational research will know that often a lot of it is very not practical. You'll usually read it and think, that's interesting to know. What do I do with this information? I've sort of taken that and experimented with it with a crap load of students. And I've realized that there are some things that are relatively easy to get started and make it much easier to do this retraining process. And that's what I'm gonna leave you with now. So I wanna break it up into two different categories. One are things that you can do in the short term that will give you pretty instantaneous gains. They're not gonna be like game changing, but they are things that get the ball rolling and start slowly retraining the way that you think. And then there are things more long term, they're sort of the prerequisites to really create lasting transformative change. So I do recommend that you do both of these at the same time. Obviously, you can't do the long term ones after the short term ones because then you'll just have to wait for ages to see the benefits. It's better to start the long term ones now and then do the short term ones at the same time so that by the time the long term gains are starting to kick in, your short term gains are already there from the short term strategies. Okay, that's really obvious. I don't know if I needed to explain that, but okay. Here are the two different types of strategies that we can go into. So the first short term strategy is just to figure out at what level of learning you are at right now. So if we think back to the previous diagram uh, where we have the different levels of learning, we want to see what most of our study techniques, what most of our time and effort and energy is going into. Are we more about isolated information? Or are we about really expansive, big picture networks of thinking? Or are we even at the stage where we're comparing different big picture networks and entire knowledge structures against each other to prioritize which schema makes the most sense? If you're already at that top level, probably have a really good memory and you understand things super deeply and you're probably like getting, you know, the top marks for your respective cohort already to begin with and you're sort of maybe already the person that everyone else wants to become uh, and maybe you can pick out a few additional tips from here that can help you just uh, edge that up a little bit closer but for most people and this is kind of just the statistics of it most people are going to be down in those lower orders uh, most people are going to be using techniques that are just like lots and lots of flashcards a lot of fact recall lots of rewriting or, or um, relearning maybe there's just heaps of past paper um, questions, which is sort of in this uh, mid-level where we're applying it and we're creating some basic relationships between things, but it's not really very expansive. It's not looking at the entire topic. It's usually just like small pockets of relationships that aren't connected with each other in a meaningful way or very prioritized. If you look at the techniques that you're using and you think, what part of thinking, what type of thinking is this activating? That will allow us to figure out what level we are sort of on. You can have a look at the revised Bloom's taxonomy or solo taxonomy as well for further reference to just try to see roughly what level you're at. And so the short-term strategy is fairly straightforward is number one, we just wanna go up a level. So whatever level you're on, start incorporating a few of the strategies at the level above. And you might wanna start slow if it's really difficult, just a couple of those higher order learning techniques. And then when you get more used to that, you can use a few more and a few more and a few more and a few more and so on and so forth. I usually don't recommend that if you're at a lower order that you jump straight to the highest order. And the reason is because it's gonna be a little bit overwhelming. Your brain is not really ready for that. It's kind of like being a couch potato and then going straight from that to running a marathon. Step number one, short term, we go up a level. Step number two is to start creating some pre-study structures. 
So when I refer to pre-study, what I'm talking about is pretty much any type of studying that you're doing that is before the main learning event. So it could be in class, it could be in lectures, or maybe if it's a big self-study session that you're having, pre-study just refers to any little bit of studying that you're doing that would make that session easier. So if you're going to class or lectures, it's about what can you do before the class or lecture to make the class or lecture experience more useful so you can extract more learning from it and walk away with it having understood more. Pre-studying is an effective way to overcome that. But most people are pre-studying at a very lower order level of learning and their pre-study is basically the exact same technique that they would normally use in their revision or you know in the lecture it's like the same thing they're just doing it earlier and that's not an efficient use of time because your brain is not really ready to absorb information at that level of detail what we want to do is we want to lay out a basic organizational structure so that when the information comes in we know where it's going to fit it's kind of like if you imagine moving into a brand new house and you've got all this furniture from your old house you're not going to just get the people to move your furniture in shove it in through the front door and just lay it wherever it ends up laying and then walk into your house and think all right cool time to move the furniture around what's more efficient is to have a look at the house look at the rooms and visualize okay i can put my lounge set here i'm gonna put my dining table over here i'm gonna put my you know the items in my clothes over here i'm gonna put my you know computer over here and arrange my desk you know maybe in this corner or maybe i'll arrange it in this corner so what we're doing is we're really figuring out where in the house we want to put these items so we want to spend a little bit of time maybe 10 15 minutes learning just a little bit about some of these big ideas so we can at least figure out where approximately we want to lay out the information we want to create some very simple groups and a really good rule of thumb that i'd say is whatever topic that you are about to study and i do recommend it doing it for an entire topic at once rather than just individual lessons because sometimes there are really important groups that of that you can create between multiple lessons and it's just a waste of time to go through lesson by lesson and then realize oh you know i should have actually put all of this together because that makes the most sense better when you're doing the pre-study because it's so superficial to begin with you can actually manage to do like a whole week or even more of content in one go and not overwhelm yourself because you're only really taking a very very superficial slice of just the biggest ideas so take that entire topic and then divide that down into the three or four main ideas and then take those three or four main ideas and figure out what the relationship is between them what is the basic framework the basic backbone that we can build for this information and you'll find that actually this is a pretty interesting engaging experience your brain is working back and forth and you'll be evaluating different structures and this is a way of exposing yourself to higher order learning and just getting used to that uh, if you haven't encountered that before and you'll find that doing this and just working with three or four main ideas makes a really big impact for when you go and actually study it properly if you have a bit of extra time and you're able to do this fairly easily then do another layer so do the three or four main ideas and from each main idea figure out the two to four ideas that are within them so we might have sort of these sub ideas that exist between them and we can figure out how all of these things are related as well so we might end up with something like that but if you don't have time to go to that level don't worry about it just getting three to four main ideas and seeing how they fit makes a really really big difference to creating some structure in your brain and prepping your memory to receive all this new information and the third thing that we want to do is start delaying our note taking so a lot of people will write notes as soon as they hear the information but by writing notes as soon as the sensory information comes in what we're doing is we're essentially offloading the work that our brain would have to do to make sense of it by putting it on paper and so we have that sense of security my notes are on paper i don't have to worry but that's not actually a good thing because if we were to hold on to it in our brain it forces our brain to deal with the information and process and organize it and that's uncomfortable and it's like man how am i going to hold on to this and our brain has to work overtime and that in itself is actually what produces the learning by writing notes straight away we actually stop our brain from having to do that our brain gets to take a rest and learning doesn't end up happening which is why you can go through an entire lecture writing heaps and heaps of notes a couple of hours later you look at it and you don't remember half of it that's because the information was not encoded at all 
In fact, it's pretty easy to just write mindlessly without even thinking about it. I had an old history teacher in high school that made us write everything for like an entire hour. I used to always fall asleep in class. And uh, I can tell you that I actually genuinely don't remember anything <laughs> I learned. And I, you know, I don't even remember what subjects and topics I learned in this class, but I do distinctly remember sitting there writing notes endlessly. It's an issue because if you've been in that experience before and you respect your teacher, you may think that that's a good way of studying because your teacher makes you do it. I'm in a position where I'm actually working with schools and teachers as part of my job. And let me tell you, there are a lot of teachers that mean well and genuinely care about helping you succeed, but they do not know how learning and the memory works. Delayed note taking simply means instead of writing notes straight away, just hold on to that information in your head first, think about it, process it, manipulate it, make it your own, make it make sense to you. Think about it, maybe ask some questions about it. And when you get to the feeling like that makes sense, then write the notes in your own words on there. It's a little different to paraphrasing because it is happening in our head. And it is not like a mega awesome ultra technique. You know, it's just for those people that really struggle with getting rid of that note taking chain. It just helps them break that habit a little bit more and then opens the door to a range of other techniques. So those are the three short term strategies that you can use. And now we have another few long term strategies that we can use. So the first long term strategy is simply about increasing what is called the cognitive load tolerance. This is the idea that whenever you're doing higher order learning, better encoding, pretty much any technique that is efficient, it does require you to use your brain and be pretty active and that can feel uncomfortable. It can be quite confusing. Uh, you go back and forth and you can sometimes feel like you're not really learning because you're not writing lots of notes, but there's actually a lot going up here. So it's, it's time well spent as opposed to spending time writing heaps of notes without anything going on in here, which is actually a waste of time. Cognitive load tolerance and increasing this means that we're getting more and more used to doing higher order learning. We're getting more used to that sense of confusion and we're getting more used to using that confusion to figure out how to organize information. It's like if there's a really difficult problem to solve, you know that you're gonna have to really sit there and think about it. And that feeling is what is you know, the symptom of your brain working uh, to, to really use the information and to do something with it. A lot of the time when we're studying, we're very, very passive. And so we're not actually doing anything with the information. Building cognitive load is a really important and sometimes very difficult step for students that have been used to passive note taking, passive studying techniques. So if your studying technique is mostly writing notes, reading the notes, rewriting the notes, doing past paper questions and heaps of flashcards, these are all pretty relatively different, differing levels of fairly passive. So you're not gonna be used to holding onto information and processing and manipulating at a higher order. Building up the tolerance for it is just like building up physical strength. You have to work on it slowly over time to just strengthen the processes that allow you to do that. So how can you increase your tolerance? Well, actually the short-term strategies that I've talked about if you continue to apply them and you continue to use them diligently, they will over time build that cognitive load tolerance cause going up a level increases cognitive load, delayed note taking increases cognitive load, simplifying ideas into three or more main ideas and thinking about relationships increases cognitive load. So all of these things will improve your cognitive load tolerance. And then the second final thing that we're gonna give you for the long-term strategy is about critical reflection of your technique. And what I'm talking about here is understanding what works and what doesn't work. And this may seem like a really fluffy, soft skill type thing, but it's actually extremely important. When I work with the students going through my course, a lack of critical reflection is probably the number one reason why people will fail to improve. Even when I'm literally teaching them the technique with actual examples, they will still not be able to use it because a critical reflection might not be there. Which, by the way, we actually teach in the course as well how to do it. It's just that some people don't feel that it's very important. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking this is not important, you may need to listen. You may be the one that needs this the most. What critical reflection is talking about is being very clear about what particular components of your studying technique or system are working and contributing to higher quality learning and what things are not 
and might just feel like you're being productive. A great example of this that's not about studying would be like time management. A lot of people feel that they are being productive by scheduling their day and arranging their tasks, except it's only productive if you execute on that. It's not productive if you just did it and then didn't do anything with your schedule or follow your plan. So this is the illusion of productivity. It's the same thing, there's an illusion of studying. Writing lots of notes, making lots of flashcards is not necessarily good quality learning. It may not be in your brain. So critical reflection means looking at your study techniques and thinking about, okay, what parts are working? Why are they working? And how can I make it work even better? And what parts are not actually contributing? And can I remove that? So it's about taking away the parts that don't work and enhancing the things that do work. So a lot of the techniques that I teach, including the techniques that I teach in my course, which can be relatively specific, they are drawing on fundamental cognitive processes that we already know work. And people may be using components of those systems in their existing techniques. But if you're also using techniques that aren't working, that's gonna overall hold you back. One of the things that I always try to encourage for all of my students is to be very, very critically reflective of their system. Look at all the components and always bring it back to the theory about why things happen. And this is the reason why my videos are pretty long and I know people complain about it all the time, but I just feel it's really important for people to understand the theory behind why things work because otherwise you don't have the skills or the knowledge to solve your own study related problems. You don't know how to improve yourself. It's like having a car, but not you know, being able to repair it. You have to go to the mechanic every single time. And what I want is for people to be the, the mechanic of their own brain. If you understand the theory, you can take a studying problem and think, okay, why might my technique not be working in some situations? And then draw that back to a, a solution that can actually help and can actually work. These are just some fairly simple strategies that you can start using in the short and long term to help improve your memory, deepen your understanding, train yourself to be smarter, and hopefully give you a little bit more control over the studying process. I hope you learned something new. If you did, please make sure to leave a like and a comment. If you enjoy this type of content and you wanna see more, then I'd appreciate if you leave a subscribe as well. Thanks for your attention and I'll catch you in the next one.